Hello, good morning, and welcome to today's Development Finance Today Roundtable. Um, we are going to be discussing everything about the future of what sustainable development might look like. Um, this is incredibly topical. Um, I'm really excited to dive into this conversation with our panel. Uh, my name is Karen Schruder. I'm your host, uh, Managing Director of MediaNet Publishing. And uh, we're supported today by West One Loans. Thank you so much to Guy and Alan, who we've got on the, the roundtable today for supporting this series. We also have Ben Spencer, a director at GS8, which is a developer that is working really hard on innovative uh, ways to deliver what he calls planet positive homes, uh, which is good news for all of us. Um, DFT as a publication has been providing a platform for sustainable property creation news for quite a few years, but the events of the global pandemic definitely brought everything into much sharper focus. Uh, we were forced to look at our environment in a much different way. 2022 has certainly seen a shift in the mindsets of our readers uh, who represent a cross section of developers, brokers and lenders. Everybody wants to hear more about ESG. It's the topic du jour and businesses have a responsibility now to factor in policies that are less nice to have and more a requirement to trade competitively. Among all of this, however, there is a very real need to produce more housing, but it does need to meet our ambitions of net zero emissions in UK real estate. Furthermore, we're plagued by a period of what is still defined by recovery as a result of the pandemic, and is also marked with soaring inflation and those rising interest rates. This is all to say, while very gloomy, that we know what the direction of travel is, but the road is far from smooth. Policy recommendations and regulation have come in thick and fast since 2007, aimed at energy and fish efficiency improvements and lowering emissions derived from the sector. However, it has been criticized as not being far reaching enough and unsupported by the tax system. I'm sure this is something that we'll get into later today in the conversation. There are some upsides to this or some positive lights, uh, including some industry initiatives that are picking up the mantle where it comes to setting out informal benchmarks and filling the gaps in framework that aren't yet sort of filled by policy. I also would like to highlight that projects and initiatives led by companies like GS8 and Ben are definitely showing us the way forward and it is incredibly positive to be hearing from him today. Um, he will be telling us a lot more about his journey to creating the UK's first carbon positive and zero waste projects. As we operate quite heavily in an unregulated space, there is a reliance on all parties to do the right thing. But is the pro-climate message reaching everyone? Or to borrow an analogy that I heard this morning, is it a bit like electric cars? Demand is increasing, but ultimately, can it be seen as prohibitive in terms of cost and convenience and therefore difficult to mass market? How can we break free from that sort of analogy when it comes to building greener? We're seeing a lot of lenders expanding their green offerings. And a question I have for the panel is how much demand is there really? And are brokers plugged into this? How much of an obstacle is access to funding? And could healthy pressure by brokers be applied to embrace and encourage further progress from lenders to back eco-conscious house building? So for now, I'm going to hand over to our panel and for them to tell you a little bit more about themselves. I will um, start with Kai, if that's okay. Yeah, sure. My name is Kai I work at West One Loans, uh, which is a specialist lending business, um, and I run the development finance business where we finance uh, residential developments, usually between about one to 20 million. Thank you. Alan? Um, so uh, I'm Alan Coleman. Uh, I work with uh, with Guy as one of the portfolio managers um, in the development finance team uh, at West One as, uh, as well. Thanks, Alan. Good to have you with us. And Ben, over to you. Uh, hi, so my name is Ben Spencer. I'm managing director and co-founder of GS8. Um, we're a construction and development company based in London. Fantastic, thank you. Um, just a reminder to those that are tuned in live, uh, we do have a Q&A function um, where you can ask questions throughout the session and we will try to get to as many of those as possible. Um, okay, so I'd like to kick off the conversation uh, with 
a contribution from Guy and Alan around the lending landscape when it comes to supporting green developments. Um, what are you seeing as a funder or as a funding partner to these developers um, right now? What does demand look like? What is your overall impression of what, what is expected from you as a lender at the minute? Yeah, so I'll start on that one. So I think uh, we're hearing more and more about it um, and we're working hard behind the scenes, I guess, to, to put together initiatives where we think we can actually help and encourage developers to be more green and sustainable and, and focus on that. I think going through funding a, a site like this of, of Ben's and has been really great because it's a good learning experience for us and it's sort of we sort of I guess see Ben as a bit of a trailblazer in this um, and I think he can sort of set the scene for a lot of developers thinking about how, how you actually go about this. Um, from our perspective we want to be supporting sustainable developments it's a big thing we think about most days. Um, we've obviously seen lenders in the market go into it which is which is great to see. Um, and there's various ways that we can help incentivize developers uh, to, to build greener. But I think from my perspective, in terms of the, the demand currently out there, I think as a whole, it's, it's minimum. So if I think about the uh, new deals that we see come across our desk, it's probably a small percentage in terms of people focusing on, on green initiatives. Um, but I think, as you sort of said, uh, the analogy towards the um, electric cars, we, we saw a few on the roads and now it's just exploded and that's what people expect. So I think it's in, in its infancy, but I guess all the institutions, the financial institutions behind it, whether it be us as specialist lenders or the funds that we borrow our money from, um, everyone's thinking about it and everyone's working in behind the scenes to, to do stuff about it to make sure that we can be as supportive as possible for, for customers like, like Ben. Thank, thanks very much, Guy. That's a, that's a good overview. Alan, is there anything you'd like to, to add to that? Um, uh, just uh, aside from echoing what, what Guy said, uh, I wouldn't really um, say there's much else uh, apart from as, as lenders, we just uh, have to make sure that we are uh, making uh, not just uh, brokers, but also developers aware uh, that there is access to uh, funding. Uh, for these innovative uh, products uh, and projects um, going forward. Uh, so rather than being a, a barrier to them, uh, we'll actually uh, try and help them uh, to do it, as, as I was saying. When devising a product to support something like this, where do you take your um, your knowledge from? Do you take that from brokers and developers? How are you gathering the intel that will ultimately make up a, a, a product that is very specifically targeted at supporting eco-development? Yeah, it's a good question. I think it depends how far you want to go with it. You know, there's a, a one measure being EPC ratings and, and basing a product off that. A lot of people have done that. And um, the longer term sort of mortgage market has has based it on that because it's, it's an easy measure. But I guess that only goes so far in terms of EPC ratings. There's a lot more to it. Ben will probably talk us through that a bit later. So I think from our perspective, we'll gather as much information as we can out of the developments that we fund. But again, I think it's all a learning experience for us and funding these types of sites um, is probably a way where we can learn quicker because um, we're actually more involved with them and seeing it um, firsthand. So yeah, I think, look, it's information. You have to do quite a lot of research, but I think going through and funding these sorts of developments is probably the best way um, yeah. to really understand it and um, to actually understand how you how you measure all these factors and then how how best it's um, to you know create the finance finance product to help incentivize this stuff and I guess you've also got to factor in um, what it costs for developers to put together this stuff so it does the, but in terms of what we can provide on, on the financing side um, outweigh the, the costs that developers have to put in um, to procure the sorts of developments um, as you'll hear with, with Ben. 
Thank you. Um, so Ben, uh, we'll come over to you to hear a bit about the origins of GS8, what your initial ambitions were and where you've got to really. Sure. Um, so I think as a business, when we first started, we've uh, our underlying goal has always been to deliver homes to, 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 to people that want to live in them rather than investors. So principally our demographic has been first time buyers and, and young families. And, and what we found after a couple of years is there was a pattern that once, you know, particularly first time buyers had scraped together money for a deposit um, and potentially, you know, furnishing or other things that, that come with buying a house for a first time. There was very little disposable income available in the first year or two as a result of that. So I'd say about five and a half years ago, we we decided we wanted to try and deliver homes that had little to no utility bills to be able to put a bit of money back in our residents' pockets. Um, and actually, once we started to to kind of venture into exploring how we would do that, um, started to understand actually that there was there was a very strong intrinsic link between energy, waste, and carbon. Um, and at the time, you know, we we knew very little about um, you know the carbon emissions that. That the industry were producing um, and how much of a, a large percentage that contributed to, to the total emissions for the UK and, and globally and particularly also how much waste stream came out of development sites even though it was staring us in the face as a construction company you know you're just you're blinded to it because you know when I um, I guess it was training or learning, you know, on construction sites, which is normal to throw something in a skip and it goes away and you don't think anything else of it. And so, um, you know, at the same time, we, you know, we, we did have an understanding that, you know, trying to achieve BREAM or, you know, Code for Sustainable Homes at the time and other kind of industry benchmarks or, or accreditations mm -hmm. were quite expensive and time consuming and very much tick boxes. And so, so we decided to kind of you know, bring a team together, you know, clean clean the whiteboard or, or you know, go with a clean slate and try and create a, a you know, viable, I and mean, I'll come to the viability part later, um, you know, regenerative or sustainable building framework that could be flexible and rolled out across all of our sites. Um, and so we set ourselves three main targets. Um, on the construction side, it was to be carbon negative. We were calling it carbon positive, as you mentioned in the intro, but terminology has moved on since we started five years ago, and it's now deemed as carbon negative, um, which um, which we define as um, the, the over a full life cycle. Um, you know, from the from the embodied carbon perspective. Um, we define it as storing or sequestering more carbon in the buildings than the remaining embodied carbon emissions for man-made materials, you know, concrete or, um, you know, metal work and things like that, that, that maybe can't be avoided for engineering reasons, um, at least in the short term. And so, so we currently have on our, on our Orford Road project that uh, West One are funding um, a 1 to 1.4 ratio, 1 being embodied carbon from man-made materials, 1.4 being the kind of sequestered carbon in the natural materials, timber frame, you know, and, and other natural products, which I can come on to later. Um, the, the zero waste component is, uh, is, is as it says on the tin really, so our construction sites are now completely zero waste, so we, we don't use any skips. Uh, nothing goes to landfill. Everything gets 100% reused and, and closed loop in, into the finished buildings, with exception to contaminated materials, which obviously we're unable to reuse. Um, and again, I can I can elaborate on how we've how we've um, you know reused some of those waste stream or or products that would typically be disposed of uh, later. And then the final piece is in operation to be um, you know net energy positive. Um, which also has an impact on the on the operational um, carbon or net zero um, performance. And so the way that we do that is we took a very much fabric first approach. We look to reduce our facades down um, to the minimum um, number of materials possible and really focused on quality of execution and um, particularly on, on air tightness and air permeability. And what that did is that took away the need to, um, you know, really go heavy on the buildings with renewables, um, which is where a lot of people spend money and where that kind of viability point comes into question. Um, so, you know, we we 
we've we're experiencing now and also you know the modeling is showing that you know the houses will be passively heated and cooled throughout the year um you know the heating demand is very low um you know the the energy demand is is very low um and so you know all of those things three things combined have driven um the, the framework or the creation of the framework and all of everything that, that falls within that um so i mean do you want me to elaborate a bit more on the are these or is there any questions initially on that i have a couple of follow-up questions um in terms of the framework that you've created do you consider this proprietary to GS8 or would you like to see it rolled out on a wider scale? Um, I'm hesitant to use the word franchised out, but could it be could it be used by, by other developers and, and builders? Yeah, definitely. The, the, the thing, you know, at the end of the day, we, we are a construction company. And so we've tried to simplify this process as much as possible. Um, and that's one of the reasons why we didn't want to align ourselves with any accreditations. You know, for example, the buildings performed to Passive House standard. Um, actually, they're twice the benchmark of, of Passive House. But we, um, you know, we, we're not interested in passive house accreditation because of everything that comes with it. And, and certainly, so our, our intention is to to conclude the Orford Road project, which we expect by the end of July to be off site. Um, to to do maybe uh, to, to roll it out on maybe one other of our projects, and then effectively outsource the blueprint to the market. Um, you know, and kind of learn back from from others. I guess trying trying it out. Um, we're working on two other frameworks at the moment, which are which are slightly more ambitious and also an evolution of of the first one. Um, particularly as we scale up, um, you know, to to or scale this onto our larger sites, you know, fifty hundred units plus. Um, you know, there there is going to be some evolution that's required because some of what we've done is is quite bespoke to this project. Um, but nevertheless there's a clear there's a clear roadmap to be able to achieve that um so yeah i think i think very much so you know th this is a blueprint it's actually very simple when you break it down what we've tried to do is simplify each element um at, in order to, to bring costs down and to maintain viability because you know i guess the overarching um goal of this is if you know we're a business at the end of the day and we're a business that needs to make profit you know what we're doing is not for exhibitional purposes, it, it, it is really to to you know the future of our business and what we believe the future of the housing industry and and I guess the built environment. So yeah, it has to be flexible and it has to be scalable across you know you know all companies and all projects. That's yeah, it's very interesting. Um, when you were during this journey, which I when did you, when did uh, was the company founded and when did this all start? Uh, which year? So we we founded the company in late 2014. Um, oh, it's not so quick. And um, <laughs> and we started here. And we started this about five, just over five years ago, creating this framework. What what would you say would be the top sort of two or three obstacles that you faced along the way? That I mean, was there ever a time where you just thought this is this is too much? The odds are sort of stacked against us. <laughs> uh there's been challenges i think i think the one of the challenges is is um definitions you know like how do you define net zero carbon negative you know energy positive so on so forth so actually it, it took us i would say three to four months just to establish like what our definitions are going to be before we could even start you know putting pen to paper on everything else um, I think industry knowledge and like knowledge, you know, it took it took eight to nine months of workshops between uh, led by us and our sustainability consultant. And, and to be honest, we were learning as much as everyone else um, in that process um, of, of actually before we started designing the principles and things that, that had to be, I guess, adhered to and considered and, and the process that had to be taken. Um, and I think availability of, you know, products in the market both um you know both from an energy perspective and from a you know natural material perspective that also have you know performance um uh, i guess criteria um or, or values that are approved by you know building regs in the uk um and fire regs and insurance and and you know all of the various other tests that that you know have to be have to be adhered to 
Just on that point, then, have you, like, uh, just thinking about it, like the procurement of this must be super difficult and, and quite niche, obviously. Have you seen, like, suppliers? <coughs> you've obviously had to work with suppliers to get some of this stuff together. Have you seen them change what, what they're looking at and, and come up with new products to, to help, I guess, more energy efficient homes? So I think what we found in the end, is so, so we actually procured the buildings before we designed them in terms of materials, and that was one of the ways that we managed to, to drive the waste down. So you know, rather than saying to our architect, go and design me a building, and then we'll procure the building you know, based on the design, or procure the materials based on the design, we actually um, pre-procured the materials in terms of you know, sizes and products um, because we were using standard you know, sizes, we knew they would be readily available. Um, and that kind of drove, um, you know, what, what we ended up designing in, in terms of the buildings. So so that, that we were able to simplify that process and deal with that a bit, a bit easier. Um, I think in terms of, um, you know, the niche products, um, yeah, it's, it's difficult. There's, there's more and more product coming to market that's doing, you know, that's, that, doing the same as traditional building materials now so I think you know doing this from here on in is going to be a lot easier than when we started this four or five years ago but but yeah for sure it's um it was a challenge at the start yeah, yeah. yeah that makes sense okay. so also carrying on on the uh, procurement side of things um you mentioned you're, you're moving on to your next project as well how do you think the uh, current um climate uh, give it geopolitical and just economic uh, full stop how difficult will it be uh, to procure those materials um, going forward do you think um, i mean look there's we we predominantly work with timber you know and wood based materials and there's a massive shortage of those across the industry not just in the uk so i think everyone needs to take that into consideration um so yeah it's, it's a really hard question to answer i think we just need to take it you know month by month at the moment but um yeah, I mean, it's it's hard to say. You know, I think I think there's enough materials out there, um, and also there's enough waste stream out there. Um, you know, the the you know, for example, we reused all of the blocks from our existing um, industrial buildings for the inner beam and block foundation. We used all of the all of the reclaimed bricks as the uh, facade for one of the one of the buildings, and as like a corbelled foundation for for part for one of the blocks. You know, we've used recycled steel purlins and steel beams for some of the roof structure. So, you know, I think that there are solutions that doesn't work at scale because, you know, when you're delivering 500,000 plus units a year, it's hard to be that adaptable or that, or that nimble. Um, so I think, you know, I guess the supply chain will find its feet over the next six to 12 months, I hope, and there should be a more ready supply. Um, but it's very hard to predict at the moment. I think we've got a bit of pain to, to go through yet before we reach that stability point. Um, ben, is the labour required on projects like this? Would you consider it specialist or specialised and uh, is it readily available um, to you? I mean, across the sector, we do have a, a little bit of a shortage in general, but now we're talking about non-standard builds. How does that impact you? So I think, firstly, our frames and the actual building itself, apart from the fact that it's fully deconstructable at end of life, it's just a traditional timber frame. Um, so, so we are in in house. We're a specialist timber frame contractor. Um, so I, I know there's very few others available in the market. Um, and so, you know, I think yes, that is specialist to a certain extent. But um, you know, a lot of the house builders are, you know, have have that um expertise i guess in-house um some of them have you know timber timber frame factories um so i think you know it's starting to become more more widely um uh, or the expertise is, is you know more widely available um in terms of working with the waste um yeah that is that is particularly specialist but there's some great um small companies out there um you know that are, are specialists and architects particularly are specialists in in circular economy practices and design and so i think they're going to come to the forefront over the next next couple of years particularly but i, I think it's just an evolution you know it, it's it, you look at you look at the way that the building industry has progressed over the past you know 100 200 300 years 
you know, there, there's points when, you know, new technology and new machinery and new ways of construction, you know, get introduced. But actually, really, the, the main part of this is just a shift from, you know, RC frame or steel frame to, you know, potentially working with more timber or working with, you know, materials that have more natural properties or of natural origin and you know thinking about the longer term life cycle of those materials so how do they get reused at end of life and you know that kind of mechanical fixing of things rather than potentially you know welding or adhesive and things like that yeah um alan uh, just coming over to you when uh, a scheme like this um the author road one that you that you guys have supported when that arrives at your desk what are the first things that you would look at um, in terms of maybe obstacles to overcome or challenges that are specific to a, a deal like this or a project like this? And secondly, which is a question that's come through here about how it impacts your approach to valuations. OK, so in terms of your sort of first question there, um, so we we look to, to approach uh, every deal uh, on its own merit and uh, assess it on its own merit anyway. Uh, but uh, obviously there will be some uh, more specialist uh, considerations to be taken here. Um, but ultimately, uh, it's just coming down to what will it cost to procure this? Do we have? Do we think that the developer has the experience to procure this? And therefore, would we be in a position to help them fund it? Um, so if we can answer those uh, sort of three uh, fundamental questions, and um, then we'd uh, look to progress um, uh, the deal forward um, and then what was your second question again sorry um how a deal of this nature might affect valuations i'm sure it's very i'm sure it's a very similar to your first answer but are there any specifics from your that team uh, that you would expect them to flag perhaps um not necessarily uh, any massive things for them to consider uh, obviously as as ben says uh, you have to still consider that uh, there are businesses uh, involved and you have to think about the sustainability so uh, providing that there's uh, enough profit um, to be be made there um, and that uh, there won't be many huge obstacles uh, that would potentially affect the demand uh, for these houses once they're complete then i wouldn't see why uh, there would be many uh, issues with the valuations uh, we also have an internal valuations team um, separate to having these valued uh, externally and um, so they'll uh, give their insight uh, as well uh, which is always useful. Ben do you see um, this sort of housing being available to various parts of the first time buyer market as in are we aiming are you aiming for sort of mid-market type buyers or and how where does affordability factor into all of this because we are in a little bit of a pressurized time from a just economic general economic point of view how big is that part of the market that you're aiming for if indeed it is mid mid to high yeah, so so traditionally for us, you know, we've targeted the uh, I would say three hundred to six hundred thousand um, pound like capital value market. Um, you know, sub kind of six fifty, you know, seven hundred pound a foot, absolutely max. You know, our Walthamstow project that we're talking about now, we we acquired it six and a half years ago when values were much lower, and you know, we've kind of out of our comfort zone as to where those values have have grown to, um, which I think both we and West One were, you know, very surprised by it. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, that that's the target. You know, we designed we designed this framework, this development to work at that kind of level. Um, and going forward, that's the market that we'll be targeting. So I definitely think, um, you know, I definitely think it's possible. Um, and Ben, just to give, I think, a bit of colour, like when I walk through the show home, do you want to just talk through a bit of like the materials and stuff that you've used, like uh, highlights were the sort of brick walls and the lampshades and the worktops and stuff? I think that's pretty, pretty cool. Yeah, sure. So um, so I think one of the things that we that we tried to do with, with, the, with this development and also with the framework is to find materials that um have dual performance so you know one of one of the ways that we managed to bring the or, or bring the waste down to zero on the project was to reuse 100 percent all the soil that was excavated from the 
from the foundations. So effectively what we did is we, we pressed it um, with a with a straw, like a just straw that you would find in, you know, anywhere um, uh, as the binder and let them dry for a couple of months and actually reinstalled them as uh, as compressed earth blocks and compressed earth bricks in the, the party walls. So it provided both the, the kind of thermal and acoustic insulation for the for the party wall, um, but also an aesthetic finish, um, which, uh, which which looks great. It's been one of the main thing that any of the buyers coming in have, have drawn their eye to. Um, you know, we've also um, used, for example, like lime plasters in the bathroom because you know it's, it's a it's a great material that you know absorbs moisture humidity and and you know so works really well in the bathrooms um you know we we've, we've uh, we collect up all of our wood chippings and shavings and we send them off to a company in Birmingham called Foresso um they press them into a resin that gets sent back to us as a worktop that's then heat resistant and, uh, and water resistant and gives it like a terrazzo type finish which looks great. So there's 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 all these opportunities in waste that you know we never actually even at the start of this process realised were available. And you know the ability to to convert waste into products that look great um, that is actually very scalable, particularly in in the example of um, of the earth bricks, um, and actually very cost effective to install because you know just using the earth bricks as an example, you know whereas we would typically need multiple materials for that build up in order to achieve the same thing you know we've just got one material that gets installed that's incredibly dense and incredibly um kind of thermally insulating um you know with, with great thermal mass and and it you know does the job of, of three materials and prevents the need for example for a paint or any other finish to that wall where's the where's the best place for people who are sort of um listening to this to go and have a look at all the i guess the pictures and 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 learn a bit more because like when you walk through this development it's it is pretty cool like it's something like a house that you sort of walk into and you've never kind of experienced it before with all the different types of materials um i mean we have a website for the project which is um known as the arbor um a r b o u r um which uh, if you type in the Arbor Wardenstow should come up online and you can you can see everything there. It's like an online brochure. I'll be checking checking that out. Are there any are there any left? Well, we've only launched two weeks okay. ago. Only only three properties to the market. So yeah, we've got a couple under offer already, which is good. But, um, okay. There's, there's some. Checking that out. Um, Guy, when you when you look at a, again a, a project of this ilk. Um, and you're funding it. Do you allow for an extended sales period, sales marketing period, given its non-standard qualities? Is that mirrored by demand in a certain way? Do people need to um, consider for longer? Do they fly off the shelves in the same way? Um, well, I think funding perspective, we've got to be a bit more confident in terms of funding this stuff. So if we were pulling back leverage and making longer sales terms and it just means less uh, money in day one um, from a financing perspective which would make it harder to finance for developers so i think we've got to take a confidence look and say look we're, we're going to back the developer here um so no we don't we don't extend um time frames or anything i think you've got to be get a bit excited about these sorts of schemes when you when you're funding them um Obviously, it's it, it, it is new sorts of products coming to the market. So, I mean, it'll be really interesting over the next few months to to keep keep an eye on how the sales are progressing. But you know, from what we've seen early on, I mean, the the prices in terms of price per square foot and everything that Ben's been able to achieve has has been really really positive. Um, so, yeah, I think you've got to funding this sort of stuff. You've got to be pretty confident and and not try and shy away from, I guess where it could be perceived where there's a bit more risk, you've got to sort of back them for, for doing it just to make it, yeah. you know, easily accessible from a financing perspective. Do you think from, um, a scale, uh, do you think it's important for us to be talking more about successful partnerships like this to showcase a kind of a concept of if you build it, they will come type of thing? 
and kind of encourage to encourage more people to seek out specialist funding to make these projects a reality because i would imagine that ben perhaps you have peers who are doing something similar that a lot of these things are sitting in design pipe dream phase only um just perhaps through a lack of knowledge about what's available out there to, to make them a reality yeah i think i think talking about this sort of stuff having been on um you know we'll, we'll definitely there's probably developers listening to this at the moment thinking all oh, that sounds pretty cool i've been thinking about doing that sort of stuff i guess the question goes to ben in terms of ben what can you do or what do you think we can do as a I guess people financing this sort of stuff to, to help encourage it. I mean, where do you, if you're a developer listening to this and you want to build, you're, you're building at the moment, but you want to build more sustainable developments, where do you start? Yeah, um, I think, I think you know, for us, there, there's there's a real focus on the, from lenders at the moment to, to you know, create green products in, in you know, for, for construction finance but typically as guy mentioned earlier on they're really, really only focused on epc ratings and epc ratings um although they're a good indication of energy efficiency don't really tell the whole picture and um you know it's quite easy in a sense to achieve a high epc rating without taking any consideration um you know to, to carbon emissions um, which which for me is is you know it's like you know is hiding the bigger voice it's, it's ignoring the actually the, the bigger challenge and the bigger picture so you know I, I would be keen for for lenders to actually really um dig into that side of things and to incentivize developers to um you know achieve lower upfront carbon emissions um without the need for offsetting um because you know i'm, I'm also not a big fan of offsetting schemes because you know, they they actually, although you can plant a number of trees or pay to plant a number of trees, wherever it is, you know, whether it's in the UK or, or somewhere abroad, you know, it, it takes years and years and years for those trees to grow and actually sequester the carbon that, that's been um, created through the process. And, you know, we have a much shorter time to, to address, you know, global carbon emissions and, and climate change rates, um, you know, than the period of time that that, that would take. So, so I think just just coming back to the question is, you know, I think there should be more focus from lenders because, you know, building rigs are changing anyway. You know, there, there's going to be significant changes coming in over the next, you know, four to six weeks. Even, uh, oh, sorry, we're only in May. In, in the next eight to ten weeks, um, and you know, that that's going to put a big pressure on the industry. So I think there is going to be cost increase for the majority of developers who have not already started to adapt. So if they're able to recover some of that cost through you know lower lending rates or lower interest rates for doing it the right way then i think that that's definitely something that should be rewarded because it's, it's positive all around and being just on the cost side i mean i think if we look at what your costs are going to be um throughout this project it's probably like it's pretty competitive still against how people are traditionally building um you've obviously been working on the procurement of this for a long time so it's probably been you know a, a work of many years to do that but what's your view like it's not necessarily if you're going to build these types of homes that your costs are going to be a huge amount higher is it no i think the zero waste element or the you know has been the most critical in in um i guess reducing that so you know i take an example that you know we, we built a timber frame you know, from the point where we took the loan with you guys with with west one to the point where we actually procured the timber there was close to an 87 percent increase in the cost of of um of, t of structural timber um but we only had um i think our increase is circa like 11 or 12 percent on the project and the reason that we've been able to offset that or minimize that that increase is because of the savings we've had through you know not requiring any off cuts not pricing for wastage you know reusing yeah. a huge amount of raw material from the existing buildings so for me that that's the biggest um you know selling point or positive that's come out of this that you know we would have been underwater on this project if, if it had not been for those elements of the scheme um and and ultimately that you know zero waste uh, you know component has, has really been a lifesaver for us yeah i think that's a huge sort of 
point to highlight and should give, I guess, other developers looking at this sort of stuff a bit of confidence in terms of actually if you do it properly and you work hard on procuring and using zero waste, then you can you don't have to necessarily think there's going to be an increase in, in bill costs. Yeah. Yeah. There's a blanket misconception, I think, that these sorts of developments just cost more overall, um, and that there's a there's an ethical uplift attached to it, but it doesn't necessarily need to be that way. Um, Alan, I just want to come over. Oh, sorry, go on. <laughs> no, no, I was just going to say that probably just comes down to just a lack of uh, information being available, i.e., from. Uh, finding these uh, materials or the new products which are coming to market, which uh, Ben mentioned. Uh, and as with anything, uh, the more information there is, the more likely people are to start uh, adopting those uh, those things. And uh, rather than not uh, thinking about doing this type of development, it would be a case of, oh, actually, no, I do know where I'm going to find those materials. I do know that uh, the labour that would be uh, able to install that so therefore, uh, let's uh, find a funder who is willing and able uh, to consider funding it and then get cracking. The more, I think it's the more you know as a lender as well, the better a partner you can be because this is not transactional, this is a partnership. It's going to be throughout the course of, of several years and I think you can then pass that information through introducers perhaps or your developer clients to so that the information is flowing both ways. Um, I had a question for you around, Alan, uh, around how much of a role you think that lenders have to play with with their brokers in uh, in, in making sure that this is a part of the conversation. So during a, the sales pitch, for example, or when you're running through several of your other products that you've got, do you think this should form a, a sort of a staple part of it in order to encourage this sort of business? Absolutely, uh, because ultimately, uh, well, West One, uh, we're, we're an intermediary-led uh, business, so uh, we do a lot of business with uh, with brokers and, and other intermediaries in the the market. And um, so, on that basis, I think it we would be uh, playing a very big part um, in ensuring that we provide the information to say, actually, no, we do love uh, to to look at these products, and we will consider them uh, for for the right uh, for the right client. Um, and then they can therefore uh, confidently uh, go back to their um, potential clients and say, look, I've got this uh, option available to you uh, to help you realize this dream. Uh, and, and that's the thing, it's not really even much of a dream anymore uh, because we've got Ben here who, who's shown that uh, these things can be achieved uh, and can be achieved uh, quite sustainably and uh, at a good price. Uh, it's There's no huge um huge differential in the the procurement cost it's just having uh, access to the information so uh, we'll continue to to do that continue to provide the information to our our brokers to show them uh, what what is possible absolutely thanks alan um ben we've had a question come through around whether or asking whether there are any challenges in ensuring properties of this sort given the, the non-standard nature of the materials build yeah um so no no yes and no actually so um i think we we were very careful from the start to consider i guess the three core things that the insurers would look for and also mortgages um you know one being a, a building warranty um, you know, two being full building regs compliance and, and three being full, um, you know, fire regs compliance. And so I think working with insurers and getting them to understand that, you know, although it's a, it's a timber frame building with, you know, majority of natural based materials, which, um, you know, I think the biggest challenge was the fire. Um, you know, we managed to overcome that by um you know by a, a number of different means that we sense tested with insurers as we as we went and so i think you know now again like i mentioned that blueprint print has been created and you know all three of those boxes have been ticked um you know we, we've we've got um you know full buy-in from from our insurers anyway and, and a number of other insurers that we tested in the market um for buildings insurance in the long term so that's that's how we address that step by step 
Thank you. That makes sense. So it's just getting yourselves comfortable with it, and then you can then roll that out uh, once it's all, like you said, the boxes are checked. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I just have uh, some another note that I made, Guy. You you made reference to um, funding uh, the way lenders are funded, and that being perhaps a um, creating an impetus for them to to be supporting projects like this because my understanding is that quite a bit of the sort of private equity houses and, and different types of funders have got requirements to do this and to show a certain level of support for for ESG developments if they're in that sector would you would you agree with this do you think this is driving change yeah certainly I think you know if you're funded through institutional players like the banks or big investment firms, they're all looking at this because they want it to form part of their business and, you yeah. know, they they want to start talking about it. So even, you know, a year or two ago, you know, they started talking and asking us about it and what we were doing about it. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, I think everyone's thinking about it. Um, they want to be involved in it because um, from a, you know, business standpoint, it's, it's good to, align yourself with sustainability and the importance of building sustainable homes so yeah everyone's thinking about it um, so if you're going and in, in raising institutional capital then you know you want to have um, a part of your business that is, is helping drive uh, sustainability and building new homes that's a wonderful incentive because we know that that is something that most specialist lenders are doing at the moment is going out and seeking additional backing. So if they can use that to, to leverage their, their chances, then that would be great. Um, ben, just uh, we've only we've only got a few minutes left, but I just want to hear about what's next for you. You mentioned that you're working on developing the blueprints in order to, to scale up and to do schemes that are slightly more units. Um, is there anything else that you've got on your agenda that we should know about and, and look out for? Uh, yeah, I think um, so. What one of the one of the other things that we're looking to establish are, are waste processing facilities um, on our sites from day one um, that could be used to produce materials based on the techniques we've created from Orford Road. Um, to, to feed into to future projects and then to stay there for the duration of the um, you know the site once it's built to deal with the waste streams that are created from people living in the houses um, that, that's the thing that I'm most excited about because I think that's going to to create some really interesting opportunities and materials that you know that can be used for you know furniture and fixtures and you know you know construction materials and and all sorts of things um so yeah that that's the thing that, that i guess most ambitious for us in 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 the short to midterm and uh, also you, i had read uh, something that you've mentioned in an interview around there being quite a chasm between old school and new school approaches to development obviously you fall into the the new school category do you think that gap is closing and do you feel like you're in a slightly bigger pool of innovators or where do we sort of sit in terms of progress if you zoom out uh, what what does it look like to you sure i'm quite skeptical of this because i think you know there, there's a lot of companies that um uh, say they're doing something or you know uh, or, you know maybe have intentions but when you break down the product and what they're actually delivering there's a lot of greenwashing going on and i think i think it's partly um you know companies themselves wanting to um you know sell something maybe that's more ambitious or you know more um eco than it actually is and i think it's also um, an issue from there's no continuity at all in terms of definitions um and, mm -hmm. and you know benchmarks as far as i'm concerned you know you, you could speak to two different organizations and they could define net zero in, in a very different way so i think mm -hmm. um i think that's something which needs to change very quickly in order for the for the industry to genuinely you know progress i think that that um creating perhaps a glossary that everyone can adhere to is is a brilliant idea something that um i think perhaps we could write about in one of our publications to see whether there's a consensus that can be reached between perhaps several initiatives or informal bodies to get us to something close to a benchmark um really interesting stuff um alan is there anything else that you would like to add any final thoughts for our people viewers watchers that have that have tuned in 
Um, no, nothing really uh, that we haven't already covered. Uh, it's just, again, uh, for lack of a broken record, um, just <laughs> making sure that the information is available um, to, to developers and to brokers um, to show them that they can uh, look confidently uh, at building uh, more sustainably and, um, and with a lot more consideration for um, the environment. Yeah, I mean, I, just us talking about this on screen now is is working some ways to, towards that. Uh, we will be obviously making this available for people to read, um, you know, in perpetuity on, on our website. But I think we need to all be talking about these and perhaps not shying away from the things we don't know about it. Um, I think that we're all sort of, I think there may be a con misconception that we're all expected to enter this space knowing a certain amount and it is complex it is different it is new so perhaps we could all stand to just listen and learn a little bit so hopefully you've helped by participating here uh guy any final comments from you uh just really well done to ben and you know thanks for allowing us to i uh, guess participate and watch on in terms of what you've done you've sort of showing the way forward for a lot of people so look hats off to you and your team there's been a lot of hard work over a lot of years um but you know as i think karen you're saying we should hopefully this will get out to a lot of people and show them what can be done and it's it's pretty cool to be a part of it really and and, and see it move along so just yeah well done to you and your team then thank you I, th I think vice versa i think um you know it took a lot of vision to, to picture what we were going to do and I think it was only when Guy and his colleague came down a few weeks ago it all kind of um you know came together but um so yeah I think I think the same you know if, if more lenders can can have that vision then you know we'll be able to push forward a lot a lot more as an industry a lot quicker. To have been a fly on the wall during that pitch <laughs> would be very interesting. <laughs> Um, I'd, yeah, I'd also like to concur. Thanks again to, to Guy and to Alan for, for supporting this um, and very much to, to Ben as well for making the time. You're a very busy guy, as I uh, discovered this week. So I, I, I really applaud what, what you guys are doing um, and we'll be watching keenly for any updates and developments that happen in, in the coming months. Um, so I think we'll we'll finish off there. Uh, thanks very much to everyone who tuned in. Um, as mentioned, we will have the video available on developmentfinancetoday.co.uk next week. And we'll have a little short article, a couple of notable points and quotes included in that. Uh, but yeah, it just leaves me to say thanks once again to Alan, Guy and Ben. And uh, wish you guys, as well as all of our viewers, um, a very happy rest of your day. <laughs> cool. Thank you. Thanks all. Thank you. Bye.